So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hi there, this is Robin Norgren, and I'm your host for Montessori, Creativity, and the Meaning of Life. You can find all the work that I do on my website under www.josiesartschool.com. I like to start with some words from a book called Originals by Adam Grant. George Bernard Shaw said, The reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. On a cool fall evening in 2008, four students set out to revolutionize an industry. Buried in loans, they had lost and broken eyeglasses and were outraged at how much it cost to replace them. One of them had been wearing the same damaged pair for five years. He was using a paper clip to bind the frames together. Even after his prescription changed twice, he refused to pay for pricey new lenses. Luxottica, the 800-pound gorilla of the industry, controlled more than 80% of the eyewear market. To make glasses more affordable, the students would need to topple a giant. Having recently watched Zappos transform footwear by selling shoes online, they wondered if they could do the same with eyewear. When they casually mentioned this idea to friends, time and again they were blasted with scorching criticism. No one would ever buy glasses over the internet, their friends insisted. People had to try them on first. Sure, Zappos had pulled the concept off with shoes, But there was a reason it hadn't happened with eyewear. If this were a good idea, they heard repeatedly, someone would have done it already. None of the students had a background in e-commerce and technology, let alone in retail, fashion, or apparel. Despite being told their idea was crazy, they walked away from a lucrative job offers to start a company. They would sell eyeglasses that normally cost $500 in in a store for $95 online, donating a pair to someone in the developing world with every purchase. The business depended on a functioning website. Without one, it would be impossible for customers to view or buy their products. After scrambling to pull a website together, they finally managed to get it online at 4 a.m., on the day before the launch in February 2010. They called the company Warby Parker, combining the names of two characters created by the novelist Jack Kerouac, who inspired them to break free from the shackles of social pressure and embark on their adventure. They admired his rebellious spirit, infusing it into their culture, and it paid off. The students accepted a pair of to expected to sell a pair of or two of glasses per day. But when GQ called them the Netflix of eyewear, they hit their target for the entire first year in less than a month, selling out so fast that they had to put 20,000 customers on a waiting list. It took them nine months to stock enough inventory to meet the demand. Fast forward to 2015 when Fast Company released a list of the world's most innovative companies. Warby Parker didn't just make the list, they came in first. The three previous winners were creative giants Google, Nike, and Apple, all with over 50,000 employees. Warby Parker's scrappy startup, a new kid on the block, 
had a staff of just 500. In the span of five years, the four friends built one of the most fashionable brands on the planet and donated over a million pairs of glasses to people in need. The company cleared $100 million in annual revenue and was valued at over $1 billion. Back in 2009, one of the founders pitched the company to me, offering me the chance to invest in Warby Parker. I declined. It was the worst financial decision I've ever made, and I needed to understand where I went wrong. Original. Adjective. The origin or source of something from which something springs, proceeds, or is derived. Original. Noun. A thing of singular or unique character. A person who is different from other people in an appealing or interesting way. A person of fresh initiative and inventive capacity. From the book Firestarter Sessions by Daniel Laporte. Starting fires and revolutions require tenacity and faith. And those are hard to come by when you're feeling stuck and spirit fatigued. Spirit fatigue is a malaise with many names. Listlessness, depression, incessant resentment, chronic doubt, numbness, feeling small, A persistent fear of loss. Throw in a bad breakup, chemical imbalances, getting downsized, an accident, too much processed food, and the fear-drenched headlines otherwise known as the daily news, and we can veer toward overwhelmed. When you're physically injured, the rest of your body will make adjustments to compensate for the weakened part. It will carry the brunt in order to endure and carry on. So much so that you don't even notice that the rest of you is knotted up and fatigued. Psychologically, we can limp on for years with aching hearts and vexations, just mobile enough to manage day-to-day existence. If you're spirit fatigued for long enough, you will downshift into unconscious enduring. You endure the doubt and the gray hue and the disconnectedness. You'll begin to believe that if it's this hard for so many of us for so long, then that must be the way it is. And so you make adjustments to your desires. You amend your hopes. You repeatedly ignore your hunger. When we're spirit fatigued, we tend to make weak decisions. We compromise. And I'm not talking about the Good Samaritan compromise where you step outside of yourself and do something accommodating for other people. I'm talking about the sell yourself short kind of compromise. You know, where you tell yourself that you don't really deserve to want what you want. It's so much to ask for. That you should be more accommodating. It's more spiritual to be nice. That you really should be more reasonable. Logical people are so much more bankable than the emotional types. And this killer concept. This is as good as it gets. These are the very notions that veil the light of your essential self and keep you from what you want the most. I've been running so sweaty my whole life, urgent for a finish line. And I've been missing the rapture this whole time of being forever incomplete. Alanis Morissette. The path, the way, the formula, the secret, the answer, the answer to the secret, the all new way to the path that leads to the secret formula. In 10 steps or 21 days, whichever comes first. So many of us are always driving nonstop in hopes of arriving at peace or unshakable confidence or somewhere further down the street from anxiety. It's the irony of chasing stillness 
or trying to get ahead so we can get out of the game or of improving ourselves so we can finally accept who we are. It's exhausting. Humans are gloriously determined to get what they want. We're ridiculously insatiable. We have a propensity propensity for craving ceaselessly. Buddhists who are always trying to detach from this wheel of suffering would agree. Constant craving can be a bitch. But on the other end of longing, there is some good news. Your hunger will lead you home. Just Now by W.S. Merwin The clear sky appears for a moment, and it seems to me that there has been something simpler than I could ever believe, simpler than I could have begun to find words for. Not patient, not even waiting, no more hidden than the air itself.